So you're joining me, it's the 15th of February. Um, I got down here yesterday on Valentine's Day. My missus was happy about that. But I'm at Halton. Um, it poured with rain all night, literally 12 hours of rain. But this morning the winds turned southwesterly and to be fair, it looks quite good out there. But um, I haven't fished Halton much in the last year. But the year previous, I started fishing Halton, and what brought me to Halton was basically its history. And as carp lakes go, its history isn't actually that long when you compare places like Redmere Pool and even Raysbury and things like that was going a long time before um, Halton was. But Halton used to be a trout fishery, then they uh, ended up stocking it, mainly with long field fish at the time. And they built this super day ticket and um, I don't think that really worked out from eventually it turned into a syndicate and uh, the fish really became iconic fish like Jack, Shoulders and uh, yeah growing up I would read the magazines and I'd see these fish and funny enough as a teenager I had a photograph of Jack on my wall in my bedroom that had been on the front I think it was Cartweld or Angling Times had had it on their front cover and I cut it out and I had it on my wall and uh, you know I said to myself one day I'm going to go and fish Halton and that came about in 2016. I eventually got the ticket. By this time, a lot of that old stock, them long field fish, they were long gone, but there was still a fair few swimming around. It had fish kills and been restocked, but um, as an outcome of that, there was a lot of big fish in Halton now, probably around 20, 40 pounders. So I began to fish it. So yeah, Halton is your typical circuit water. It can be very busy at the best times of the year, you know, like spring and autumn, you're going to be, you're going to be fitting in. Midsummer, it weren't so bad, but my approach to start with, I just wanted to get a bite. And uh, funnily enough, the first bite I got from the lake that year, um, I knew it was a big fish. I was playing it and uh, unfortunately it found a snag in the margin just, just as it was around near the net. I ended up losing it and about a week later, the biggest fish in the lake got caught with my hook link in its mouth. So it weren't the best of starts, but um, I was really keen to get back. So the next week I was at work and I only had one day to go fishing. And Halton's uh, it's just under 100 miles from my house, so it ain't close. But um, I thought I'm going to do a day session. And I got up about 4am, shot round the M25, and by sort of quarter to six I had like two rods out. And um, in the same swim where I'd lost this fish the week before, about an hour passed by and right down the other end of the lake I saw a fish stick its head out and I thought, you know, they ain't where I thought they were going to be. I sat there, I started to make a cup of tea and another fish stuck its head out and I thought, right, I'm wasting no time. I chucked all the gear on a barra and I went round and I set up in a swim called Springgates Point. Anyway, I was in Springgates and I literally just fished catapult range. I put a pouch full of sell out, cast a hook bait on it pouch full of sell out and cast a hook bait on it and that was a, I put a chod out and a hinge stiff, it's quite a weedy lake. Anyway about an hour had passed and my rod went and I had my first fish of the season which was a 20 pound fully scaled mirror and I was pleased just to get off the mark and to catch a fish on a day session from Halton. I think about half hour later the other rod went and I had my first good fish from Halton, a fish known as Chips, uh, 40 pound 10 ounces. So I was absolutely buzzing. I could have caught nothing else that day and I'd have been happy. About one o'clock, the same rod that went in the morning went again and I had a fish known as Tash, 44 pounds. And it felt good because there was quite a lot of full timers on Halton. Three or four guys, you know, they're doing a lot of time and uh, it felt good to just do a day, have a brace of 40s and a 20 and then go home. But yeah, I was back in work that night. So about a week later I was back and I remember thinking, you know, um, I've caught I've lost one, had three on a day session. Halton actually ain't that hard. And you know, you get a bit cocksure of yourself, but the old carp gods come back down and they kicked me right in the nuts and I, um, I blanked for the next month. Bear in mind, at this point, I was only doing one night a week, which is what I've always done for about 15 years. And um, yeah, for the next month, I caught nothing. So I started to put a little plan into place and um, I started to bait an area, the lodge swim, that no one really fished. And I remember some of the regulars at this time, the lake had done a fair few bites, 20 bites that year. And uh, they said the fish were spooking off of chods. 
because because of the weed, the chod rig was being fished a lot. So guys were coming off a chod rig, and I thought rather than go off the chod rig, I'm going to change the shape of the bait. So what I done, I handmade my own baits, and I made the I basically had like oblong baits, just something a bit weird. And I baited this lodge swim, and my first session down, I'd had the rod in the water ten minutes, only twenty yards out, and I'd seen a fish stick its head out, cast about forty yards past it reeled back and then just brought the lead down into the air, all nice and quiet, letting that chod slide up to that top bead. And it went down with a bit of a donk. The rod had been in the water about five minutes and it absolutely wrenched round. I'm using 30 pound braid because of the weed. And I had this mega battle and eventually this big deep mirror rolled into the net. And there was a fish known as Scar at 46 pounds, 12 ounces. So yeah, I was really chuffed. Um, it had been a month without a bite, so to get a bite, I was buzzing, nothing else happened that session. I moved out of the lodge swim because I thought, I didn't want to pressure the area too much because I knew they were in and out of it. Uh, moved, fished another swim for the night, but in the night, in the dark, slipped down there and put a little bit of bait in just to keep that area going. Got back the next week. It's now my next overnighter. I finished working at night. I got to the lake about five in the morning and exactly where I'd seen this fish the week before, one sticks its head out. So I stuck a bait 40 yards out, reeled it back, dropped it into the same area, and it was like a mirror image. The rod had been in the water 10 minutes, and it ramped round, and uh, me another mega battle, big pile of weed in the net, and um, I had a fish, I can't remember its name now, but it was 44 pounds. And uh, yeah, it was great. I stayed in the swim that day, and ended up catching my first Halton 30, which was a 32 pounder. And uh, yeah, so we're now sort of just coming out of spring. I've had four 40 pounders. And I'm absolutely buzzing. My next fish weren't till about June time. And uh, the lake had been fishing terrible. We hadn't done a bite in about two weeks. And we'd had some weird weather. It was like easterly winds. And I got down the lake and it was the first time that year that I'd seen Halton and, and it wasn't busy. There was one of the bailiffs was just packing up and he said to me, oh, Good luck, he said, because it's fishing terrible. Like, And there was an easterly wind coming down and I really didn't expect them to be on this cold wind. And then out in the middle of the lake, I was in a swim called The Lookout. This fish just stuck its head out. So I thought, right, this will do. And then I got a couple of chod rigs out there. It was nothing fancy and I just sprayed bait over the area, get the fish moving between the bait. Uh, nothing happened that day. <clears throat> and I remember it was freezing. I literally zipped the bivvy door up. I couldn't believe it, but you know, it was June. About seven o'clock the next morning, my left hand rod is in meltdown. It's just a one toner. And I've picked up the rod and um, it found a lot of weed, this fish. I had it on for about 10 minutes and I'd get it out of one bead bed and it would just steam back into another. But eventually I managed to get it in the net. Um, it's a real beautiful carp, a long black one with a couple of scales down the middle. Um, 40 pound and a few ounces of fish known as Scully. So yeah, things were going well. Uh, a couple of about a week after that, it started to get hot, as you expect in June. And the fish, they were around the surface a lot, and um, they were getting in the bays. The weed had got thick in the bays, so that main body of lake, the fish were really ignoring that and getting in the bays, the dog bay and the church bay. And it was nice because you was getting to see some of these real big fish up close. And um, I can't remember my next fish. Ah, oh, it was off the surface. I had a 28 pounder off the surface. And uh, yeah, started fishing the bays. It was quite successful. It was nice to see the fish feeding. Quite often, I would put bait in and then an hour later, there'd be fish visiting it. It wasn't, you know, it was textbook carp fishing, really. I expected it to be a little bit harder, if I'm honest. The fish were, they were, they were quite, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, if you put bait in, they come and ate, ate it. They love the cell which was ironic because when I joined, one of the guys said to me, they don't like it on here. But yeah, they just couldn't get enough of it. But I started fishing these bays and the one, the one thing that stuck in my mind was the day, I've gone a bit off tangent here, Joe. Um, I got down this one day and these fish were right in the edge in a swim called the Royal Box. And uh, I'd been fishing about 20 minutes and one of the bailiffs turned up on a sit down lawnmower. And he, he was mowing all the grass because it's one of their jobs here. And obviously the fish just done the off. And uh, then someone else turned up and they sprayed a load of floaters out. And I thought, you know, one of them days when everything seems to have conspired against you. 
and uh, at, these floaters drifted out of the bay and just as they were drifting out of the bay and the weed dropped away out of the deep these fish were just picking them off and I looked and I see this little pointed nose and I thought that's one of the grass carp and the grass carp they don't actually get caught that often and I ain't a fan of them but I thought if I'm going to do a year on Halton I wouldn't mind catching just one of them so I run round the spring gates which give me an angle of where I could get a floater onto these fish so I've cast this floater out and there was a mirror about 30 pounds and this little grass carp and they were taking floaters constantly so in the end there was no floaters left except my hook bait and this mirror just slid off and this grass came up and it took the last hook bait I remember I whacked into this fish expecting it just to come towards me and it just sat there it was dead heavy and I thought well maybe this is a bit bigger than I thought anyway they don't fight grasses they're like huge bream and it came in and it tried to weed me up in the edge. I couldn't believe it when this thing rolled over the net. It ended up being the big grass here at 51 pound, 10 ounces. So yeah, it was like, even though I weren't into them, to actually look at it as a species on the bank, it was absolutely beautiful. It was unmarked, probably, don't think it'd been caught in four years. So it was, it was a pleasure to catch it. I put the fish back and um, moved up to the other end of the lake. I did a night in a small weedy corner where I was on them, but I woke up about four in the morning and the water on Halton, it's like tap water clear. You know when you're on them and that they were gone. And I was looking right down the lake, which is probably when I look down there now, it's a good, it's five or 600 yards, maybe more. And I just see a fish go like that on a margin right down the other end of the lake. So I chucked all the gear on the barra, walked the entire length of the lake. I got into this swim and I knew roughly where this fish had shown and I just underarm flicked the rod and it went bang really lovely donk on a bottom bait as well and I just put the rod on the rest and I sat back and it was in I'm not joking it was in the water a minute and a half and it absolutely just ramped around mega battle loads of weed and I've got this fish in the net 41 pounds so it just goes to show that that moving you know the right place for five minutes is better than the wrong place for 24 hours but yeah I was well happy with that as the uh, sort of month went on, I caught a few more fish out the edge. I ended up fishing a lake near home for about a month as well, which is a bit of a headbanger. Had a couple of fish out of there. By the time I start, sort of stopped fishing there and come back to Halt, and it was mid to late September, and uh, the, everything starts to change, you know, with the seasons, the weed that had been high in the bays had now dropped down below the surface the fish start to push out into that deeper water that time of year. And I remember I walked around the back of the church bay and uh, I didn't see anything. And uh, I think at that time, there hadn't been a fish out in 10 days, I remember, because a guy was doing a two week session and this guy caught a fish, quite a funny story. And in, in the spring, this guy had done a month session and he'd caught one carp and it was 26 pound. And this guy was back doing this two week session and while I was stood there talking to him, he got his second fish of the year and it was the same fish he'd caught in the spring, <laughs> which was ironic because, you know, 70 carp and he's had the same one twice. But yeah, I remember I set up in the back of the bay that night and um, I had a small fish called Becco, which I think is the smallest carp in the lake, fully scaled, about 16 pounds. And then during the night I had a recapture of Scully, um, which was the one I had at 40 pound for, about 30, I think it was 38 and a bit. So I've gone home a happy man. Next week I'm back and the bay's even more dead. The weeds died back more. And you know, I'm thinking now, I need to start bait in the middle of the lake. I need to start putting some bait where no one's fished in months. So I just sprinkled some bait along the back of the church bay, probably 10 or 15 half boilies. And I went for a walk around the lake. And uh, I stopped in a swim called the Salt Circle that gives you a real good view of the whole lake. And I thought, this is where I'm gonna put a bit of bait like. Anyway, I went back and I'd left a rod round in the church bay. As I've gone down to get this rod, I've walked in and there's the wood carving and um, it's upended, tail in the air, and it's just feeding on these baits. And uh, when I joined the lake, <coughs> obviously you want to catch some of the characters. I wanted them big, fat, <coughs> dark, round mirrors, you know, with big, broad backs on them. Like I, I wanted to catch them, but also I wanted some of them old fish one of the long field fish and top of that list would have been the wood carving just because it's such a beautiful carp. So I've ran back, I've got the rest of my gear and I've set a rod up and I've waited for it to move out. And I remember I tied up a PVA bag of crushed cell and a wafter 
and I lowered it on the spot. It weren't, it weren't five minutes and she came back in. She picked up the whole bag and just blew it all out. And I would see the hook bait drop back down. Then she fed literally on a spot for a good couple of minutes, then swam off. And you know, I couldn't believe it. Like this fish that I wanted to catch so bad, it probably had my rig in its mouth three times. And uh, my phone rang and it was a friend, he was at a gate and he'd, he was coming over for a cup of tea. And I said, I'll let you in because I've got to lift this rig out to check it. So I've lifted the rig out and it was absolutely perfect. And I was walking back and you know how your brain works when you're fishing and I thought, I've put too much bait too close to the hook. I've got to make, you know, spread a bit of bait out and cause a mistake because the fish is going to move between its own food items. So that's what I did. I lowered the rigging when I got back and then I chucked 10 half boilies and I spread them along this gravel shelf. Anyway, couple of minutes, in she comes. She's got two other fish with her now, a smaller one and one about 30 and a 20 and her. So there's these three carp swimming up and down. I couldn't even watch them. I was like a cat on a hot tin roof. And I just went and sat back and I put the kettle on and it was mate, uh, Big Rich. And I was telling him about the, the wood carving, now it had been feeding. And I got one bleep and I looked at Rich and I just said, wood carving. And I jumped off my bed chair and as I'm running down to the rod, it's just gone into meltdown. The alarm's screaming. And I've got there, my braid is shot out from under this willow and it's pointing at a weed bed and it's still going. I picked up the rod and I can feel this fish kicking and my heart's in my mouth. All of a sudden it rolled on the surface and I saw a big long line of linear scales and it was the wood carving. You know, I don't know if it's because of her age or what, because she's mega old. This fish was like a 20 in the 80s. And I'm just, she just didn't fight. She just come towards me, just shaking her head. And Rich jumped down in the wall and scoops her up one go. And we was jumping around like a pair of kids, you know what I mean? I couldn't believe me luck. But yeah, we got her out. Weight irrelevant. She was 37 pound, eight ounces. Um, yeah, absolutely. For an old fish in mint condition. Yeah, I was, I was well pleased, you know. I released her and off she swum. And yeah, I was absolutely buzzing. Sat down, one of the locals, Matt, um, came round, gave me a beer and we sat there chatting. I was telling him about what had happened like you do when you've caught fish. All of a sudden the rod screams. And I mean, normally if you catch one fish out of Church Bay in a day, that's it, it clears it. But the rod's gone into meltdown again. I've run down there, played this fish out, much harder fight this time and uh, netted a fish, I can't remember its name because I've all got names in Halton, but it was one of the ones that had been born and bred on site, which was nice, 32 pound, a really pretty carp. And it was funny because after that session, you know, our weather changes at a lake that I never saw another fish in the edge. And I started to bait out, you know, in the open water, that areas, them areas are sort of 18 to 20 feet and uh, everyone was still fishing in close. So I'm trying to stay a step ahead of what, you know, everyone else is thinking. And uh, the first night I fished the deep water, I managed two bites. I had a 20 pound linear, which funny enough, I'd na now caught three times. It seemed to like me, this fish. And I also had a, a really short, I, I shouldn't use this, but quite an ugly looking fish with half a tail, um, 32 pound. But it was nice to sort of, you know, put, a fear, put something into theory and you know it's working. And theories like that, I think you pick up over the years. It's happened on other waters. Just as an example, when I fished Sutton at home, all the fish in the summer were in the edge. And during the colder months, they were out in the middle. But there was guys that just fished one area all year round. So at certain months, they would be successful, not realising that, you know, they've got to move with the fish in the seasons. But um, that's another story. But uh, yeah, Halton. The autumn came and I remember after the, the 30 and the 20, a, a couple of weeks later, I had another fish called Silky, 34 pounds, at one of the stockies that um, had been 20 pound a year before, absolutely stacking the weight on really nice fish, like a really dark black broken linear. And yeah, the winter came in, I didn't really get any other fish and I was a bit gutted because I was expecting a good autumn, but I don't know, probably lack of effort. but. Um, yeah, nothing really happened through the autumn and uh, I disappeared in the winter. Halton's got a very bad um, winter track record. But I ended up coming back, I think it was uh, around the same time I've come back this year. It was early February and I fished a swim called the Salt Circle. Never saw any fish, just had a feeling, you know you're going off of instincts, 
fish the open water, found a lovely little spot out there that I'd had a bite of before. Nothing happened, but what I did, I put a pound of sea salt on this spot, just to sort of try and create some um, attraction, but without going mad with bakes. You know, when they come out in the winter and they haven't eaten in ages, the uh, track that's like their stomach is shrunk and they can't take on a lot of food. So I wanted to create a bit of attraction in an area without there being a pile of bait there. So that was the idea behind the sea salt and a bit of crumbed food. Came, I didn't catch anything. Done 24 hours, not a bleep. Week later, I came back and it was like a different day, you know. The sun was out, there was flies in the air, it felt glorious. It was only mid-February, but it just felt good. Um, and I remember I set up on a swim on the church bank and the sun was pounding down. I've got everything set up, all three rods, because um, you can use three rods in the winter. And uh, I'd been fishing about half an hour and I thought, do you know what, it doesn't feel right Randy, I want to go back round the other side and fish the spot where I'd put this sea salt the week before. So I packed everything back up, moved round to the other side of the lake and I got the rods out within sort of about an hour and I don't know why I sat there and I thought I feel happy, you know, I feel like I'm doing it right. The day went on, as the evening came on, I remember I stood outside my bivvy and I was just in a hoodie for the first time that year. You know, it, you know when it's getting warm, you can just wear your hoodie. And uh, yeah, I can't remember what time the bite was. It was early the next morning, just, just before first light, a swan swam into my rods. And uh, I jumped out of my bivvy to see this. It was a young swan, you know, they're still grey and it's, it's spooked off. And I thought, bloody thing, sat back in my uh, bed chair and I've laid back down. It's probably been about five minutes and my alarm's gone again and I thought, bloody swan jumped up and the left hand rod, the indicator's just sat in the eye, it ain't come out the clip. And I've looked, no swan there. And all of a sudden it's just pinged out the clip and started to go, really steady take. I've picked up the rod and it's just moving towards me slow, typical big fish, just coming towards me and I can feel it. Every now and then it's making a bit of weed and you've got that grinding, but I just kept it moving. And uh, yeah, at one point I remember thinking this is going to be a, like a good 20 or something. And as it rolled on the surface, I heard the fins in the dark like slap and I thought that ain't no 20 pounder light. And I managed to just bundle it somehow into the net. And I quickly run up to my bivvy, grabbed the head torch, shone it into my net. And there was one of these big mirrors, big broad back on it. And uh, yeah, I was well chuffed. I knew it was a good one, like over 45 pounds. So a fella come along and we weighed it and it went 50 pound and two ounces. So I was well chuffed with that light. And that really, I think that was my, tw I'd had 23 bites out of Halton in the season I'd done in 33 nights, which was quite a good going on here. And uh, I, never got, I never came back really after the 50 because I came here to catch one of the old ones and I came here to catch one of the big ones and that's what I'd done. I'm not one of them guys who wants to catch every single fish. I'm back at the moment because my ticket runs out literally a month from today. So I've got, you know, the next month, I want to try and get one more bite before that ticket ends and I move on. But yeah, it's been a brilliant experience. So tactically, my approach, um, it does change throughout the year. Normally I start the spring using monos because you haven't got, you know, the weed ain't up and things like that. So I'm normally on a 15 or 18 pound mono depending on distance. Obviously if I want to go long range, I'm dropping down to a 12 pound mono. Um, if there's weed about, I'm, I'm braid. I love 30 pound braid. I'll use it everywhere I can get away with it. Um, you know, if it's banned, then I'll drop back onto a strong mono. I believe in using the strongest main line you can because it's the safest option for the fish. You know what I mean? You, when I'm selling line to people at carp shows and things and they, they come up, I'll talk them into the strongest line I can because I believe it's the safest option. And obviously, once you start going over sort of 0 0.37, 90% of lines will sink. You know what I mean? And if I'm fishing different environments like Halton, I favoured the white line because it was gin clear. When the white line or the fluoro hits clear water, it disappears. When the weed's up and um, you know the environment is naturally a green environment, I'll use a green line. If I'm fishing a water where it's quite murky 
I use a brown line. So it's, it's a simple, I'll adapt my line to fit the environment of fish. And I'll always fish the heaviest, strongest line I can possibly get away with. The line I use, which is the RM Tech, is, um, it's got some stretch, because all lines got stretch, but probably as much as any other line. It's saving grace, which is really good. It's bloody strong. And when I was picking that line, I picked it myself. I went for the strongest line. I sat in the office, I made slots along the desk and I rubbed the line and I, I've come up with the most durable line that I could. And that's what we ended up with. <coughs> Braid is a different animal altogether. You know, um, you're using thin rope basically. It doesn't cut easily. It's not really got any downsides in my opinion. It's safer than mono. Um, probably range is its downside. You can't, you can't cast mega far with thick sinking braids, so you'd have to go thinner. Tactically on Halton, I used braid for 98% of my fishing, and that is due to the environment I was fishing in. Halton's got snags, weed, and very big fish that are powerful, and they are going to make it in the weed. I didn't want to be going out in the boat every five minutes to retrieve the fish, because I think it's not only safer for me, but it's safer for them that I land them from the bank. Um, I use big hooks, you know, a four, size four all the time. You're fishing for 40 pound carp, they've got mouths the size of teacups. A size four is lost in them mouths. So um, yeah, I was using size four hooks, 25 pound braided hook links or 25 pound chod hook links, 30 pound braid. So like real animal tactics, fishing for big fish. It's not the same tactics I would use if I went to another water, but it was the tactics that I felt gave me the best chance of landing them fish. And I think out of the 23 fish I caught from Halt and I lost one, which was the first bite. So um, I think that, you know, it was right. And not one fish did I go in the boat for. And that's because when you're playing fish and you're using braid, it cuts through weed, where nylon don't. Nylon just stretches round weed, but braid actually cuts through it. So 90% of my fishing will be done on a, like a blowback style rig. I've got a few little tweaks that I do to that rig. Firstly, it's, I don't use a ring on the back of the hook where people use a ring that slides up and down. I use shrink tubing and there's a reason for this. When you use a ring, if your bait is picked up by a nuisance fish or even a carp and dropped, the ring can land anywhere, leaving the rig unset. But if you use shrink tubing, it keeps the hair tight in place. So it's, in, it's set until it's hooked. When that fish is hooked, this, they, they will allow it to slide back. So my rig is always set. Um, I vary that between a stiff braid and a supple braid, depending on the area I'm fishing. If I'm fishing at range, I'm gonna put a stiff braid on. If I'm fishing in the edges, I'm gonna use a supple braid. I'm just doing what suits the environment. Um, I love the hinge stiff rig. It's a great big fish rig. And I also like the chod rig. Um, it's crazy, because I remember when the chod rig sort of came into fame, a bit like now you've got the Ronnie rig. Everyone's going about, um, a few people are going, ah, oh, the chod rig, it takes all the skill out of fishing. You can chuck it anywhere and catch a fish. I thought, bloody hell, give me it. You know what I mean? A rig that you can throw anywhere and it's fishing for you is what you call a brilliant rig. So yeah, it's chods for gods, right? Um, <laughs> now I'm gonna get onto bait, bait application. Quite often I hear people say, yeah, the guy filled it in with bait and that's why he done well. And filling it in with bait isn't the way, you know, there's times when you want to use a lot of bait and there's times you ain't. When I'm baiting up, if I'm pre-baiting an area, sometimes I'll pre-bait an area with 30 boilies, but it's how consistently you can feed that area. So if you can get down to a local lake two or three times a week with 30 boilies, it's almost as good as putting in 10 kilos of boilies. You've just got to consistently feed an area. The fish is only an animal and um, it will keep coming back to where there's a food source. Um, personally, I don't use a lot of bait. Last 15 years, I've done one night a week. What's the point in me fishing over 10 kilos of bait for one night? Now I fish um, professionally, if you like, for Ridge Monkey. I'll, I'll use a lot more bait because I'll have a lot more time to do something with that. But when I say a lot of bait, I'm talking two or three kilos. Um, I've never fished over 10 kilos of bait in my life because I'm looking to catch fish, not feed the bloody things. I might put a bit of bait in when I leave, 
But yeah, a bait application is important. Having as much bait at your disposal as you can is not a weapon if, if you know you can actually mess yourself up. Use it sensibly, be clever with your bait. And if you ain't got a lot of boilies, use sweet corn, use tiger nuts, use maypoles. There's so much stuff carp like. Don't get fixated, don't think that you know they, they won't accept it because they will, they're just animals. So that is my relatively short history on Halton. I did that year, didn't fish it last year, but I'm back because this is the end of my ticket. I've got one month to try and catch one. Hopefully something will happen. If it does, then I'll let Carpology know and maybe we can uh, show you what's going on. Let's go and have a look outside.